everyone, I am Sayyid Ali Jafri. I welcome you to another edition of the CISPR conversation series. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel and stay tuned for more interesting conversations, webinars, conferences, and other related events going forward. Uh, today, we are going to talk about a very important element of the South Asian strategic matrix, which is the armed forces. And in that, we'll talk about the Indian Army, particularly. Today, we have with us a person who is no stranger to South Asia and especially Pakistan. We have Colonel Dave Smith as our guest today. He's a distinguished fellow at the Stimson Center, Washington, D.C. He's also an independent consultant to the Sandia National Laboratory. Uh, he had a very distinguished career in the US military, spanning more than 30 years, 31 years to be precise. Out of those 31 years, he spent about 22 years dealing with political military affairs of, of the Near East and South Asia. And interestingly, he was not only the senior director, uh, country director of, of Pakistan in the Office of Under Secretary of Defense at the Department of Defense, but he twice remained uh, as the army attache of the US in Pakistan. And what's more, he's a graduate of the Command and Staff College, Koita, which is uh, considered one of the best military institutions in the world. And perhaps I would say it's the best in South Asia. Uh, that experience led him to write a book entitled The Koita Experience, The Attitudes and Values Within the Pakistan Army. But then as you, as you know, we follow the action reaction syndrome. So people who look at Pakistan are expected to look at India as well. So he came up with a study released by the Stimson Center last year, which was titled The Valentine Experience, uh, the, attitudes, the Values and Attitudes Within the Indian Army. So it was a comparative study and where he used the same methodology as he did for, for Staff College Koita to dissect how the Defense Services Staff College in Wellington, how that uh, goes about things and how the Indian Army and the cream of the Indian Army looks at various things, ranging from, he looked at things ranging from dem demography to uh, their views on military, on military and nuclear issues. And a lot of things stood out. What I'll do is I'll ask him a couple of questions and then we um, four or five questions and then we'll uh, have, a, have a good engagement out there. So thank you very much, sir, for joining. I had been planning to do this since your book came out last year. I read the book when it came out, uh, but today I, got, I am getting this opportunity to talk to you because I feel that um, in a nuclearized environment, it is of great import to talk about how military minds think. And given the kinds and types of officers who go on to do staff college, be it in Pakistan or in India or in any other army for that matter, their views on all things important matter. And especially on their views on all things military and nuclear do matter. And in an environment as hostile as that of South Asia, it is all the more imperative. So my first question is, uh, the war is changing in terms of its nature and character. Uh, well, well, many people would push back on this, but I believe the war, war is changing in terms of its nature and character. We see the advent of advanced technology, the advent of you know, disruptive technologies and the the proclivity of states uh, of states to integrate those technologies into their military thought process processes. Uh, when I look at your book, the first thing that comes to my mind is that the the curriculum, the methods of teaching, and other elements of the entire study process of Wellington is outdated. It is based on a very World War II kind of a model, and as one of the student officers said. All that we learned in the 44 to 45 weeks while we were at Wellington was how to uh, fight in the plains of Punjab. Now with, with war demanding a lot out of armies in terms of thinking and you know changing the very methodology of how war is fought, how would you relate that with the kind of outdated 
pedagogy methods and the content that is the, that is taught to the cream of the army of the indian army how do you combine the two and then what implications does it have for the indian army and for their ability to uh, become a, not only a military force but a military power at a time when they are expected quote and quote to confront china thank you well you know that one of the findings that uh, is in my book is that in the uh, in the event of a future war with either pakistan or china perhaps both at the same time the indian army is likely not to perform as well as it thinks it will uh, so uh, so that's one now why is that well first of all and i'm going to say some th i was you must understand that i wrote two books one was the Quetta experience, which you've already mentioned, and the second is the Wellington experience. And the reason that I wrote them with the same methodology and the same five lines of inquiry was so that there could be a comparison, an apples to apples comparison of the two military establishments. So in this uh, line of uh, inquiry number one, which I call the Wellington experience, it includes things like uh, uh, demographics, curriculum, uh, amount of joint jointness uh, in each side, the pedagogy and other things. I would say that if you compare the two books, there's probably not a nickel's worth of difference in that line of inquiry between the Pakistan system and the Indian system. So all of the complaints uh, that were made by the students that I interviewed uh, were equally mirrored by the students that attended Quetta. So that's one, and you're correct. The, uh, the curriculum is outdated. It teaches a uh, level of ground warfare or a type of ground warfare that all of, virtually all of the students that attended felt uh, was more akin to what the, uh, the British Army did in World War II than what a modern battlefield looks like. And I have to say that since 1990, the, uh, the US Army students that attended both Wellington and Quetta have quite a bit of combat experience on modern battlefields, having fought two wars in the Gulf, having been involved in some heavy combat in, uh, in a counterinsurgency environment in Afghanistan. So they, they're the ones who, uh, who made this comparison. So what is, and the other thing that is true about both sides, is that both of the staff colleges, the Quetta and, and the DSSC in Wellington, have as one of their primary focuses, not the installation of a proper military, edu professional military education, so much as evaluating officers for their future promotion potential, who will be the next general officers in both armies. Now, the upshot of that is that in both institutions, this promotes uh, an inordinate search for the staff college solution to every problem. And when this is coupled with some cultural influences that exist in South Asia, and I'm talking about the great deference that is given to elders, uh, the great reluctance to criticize army doctrine in both institutions, uh, the great weight that is placed on the attitudes of senior officers and faculty, uh, and the students are reluctant to challenge that because they think they have a perception that if they do that, then their promotion prospects will be limited. So what does all of this mean? This means they get a very conservative military education. It means that they are not taught to, as we put it in America, to think out of the box or to come up with novel new solutions to tactical problems. They're always looking for the staff college solution. What this means is in a future war, there will be no staff college solution. And officers are going to have to be able to practice a concept, which one of my uh, military colleagues here in the United States, Lieutenant General David Barno, calls adaptability. They're going to have to be able to think on their feet. They're going to have to respond quickly to a changing situation. 
they're not going to be able to look up the terabytes of previous course knowledge that they can at Wellington or the CHAPA, use of CHAPA that is uh, in Pakistan. So that's the problem. That is the dilemma. They're going to have to respond rapidly to changing conditions with an enemy that is very, very capable. And so I suspect since there will be no PCK and no CHAPA for the next war, then uh, the both armies are going to have a little bit of the same problem. Okay, thank you very much. I think this was a very succinct answer and you covered both the armies. Um, so a lot of your books refrain is linked with the prospect of um, Indo-US relations, strategic relations going forward. And you have not painted a good picture in light of your recommendations uh, in the book. Um, you have rightly highlighted that there is a great amount of suspicions, suspicion within the officer cadre of the Indian Army, both um, uh, at the DS level, the SI, the CI, and even the student officers, they do not trust the US uh, as much as the, as much as they should be, given that both are tipped to be uh, strategic brothers going forward uh, in a bid to counter China. Um, why do you think this this palpable tension that is that is that was visible in Wellington will negatively affect the strategic relations of India and the US uh, because. Obviously, if the leaderships of both country of both countries, if they are uh, bent on you know turning a page in their relations and uh, you know countering one particular enemy, uh, why do you you know place the views of the officers' corps as critical to you know sustaining or you know uh, rather you know spoiling that strategic brother uh, brotherhood? That, that is likely to take shape. Why is that Why is that a contention to you? Well, the, uh, the reasons for the tension uh, between uh, the Indian officers at, uh, at Wellington and the United States uh, has a long history. You know, we've had more than 70 years of relations with India since independence, same with Pakistan, of course. But for the first 50, uh, that relationship was very fraught. And it was fraught because the, uh, first of all, because India wanted to pursue a foreign policy of non-alignment in a bipolar world. I'm talking about the United States and the Soviet Union and the Cold War after World War II. And second, because of the US-Pakistan relation. Pakistan embraced the United States. In fact, the, uh, the saying that was, was still current when I was a student at Quetta in 1982, was that you know we were your most allied ally during the Cold War, while the Indians were basically a client state of the Soviet Union, and all of that was true for the for the first 50 years of our relationship. It was only after uh, the end of the 1980s and the early part of the 1990s that the strategic situation changed for India, and that was brought about by the collapse of the Soviet Union. 1989 through 1991, uh, all of a sudden, uh, India was without a strategic partner. It was without a, uh, you know, the, the partner that provided it with most of its military hardware. Uh, so they had to look around and, and I also, uh, it coincided with the change in the Indian economic philosophy, which opened up the country and rid itself of a lot of bureaucracy and led to an enormous growth in the Indian economy. Uh, when I was, for example, when I was in Quetta in 1982, the Pakistan, uh, you know, the GDP per, uh, per capita in Pakistan was twice what it was in India. Now that, of course, has been turned on its head by several factors. So a lot of things changed. And since that time, the last five U.S. presidents have made a big strategic bet on India, that India was the growing, largest growing economy in South Asia. It was the most militarily capable power in South Asia. Uh, and this has coincided with the growth of, uh, of China, both economically, politically, and uh, militarily. And so the idea is that the United States 
has chosen India to be its preferred strategic partner as a way to offset the growing influence of China in Asia. Of course, when you look at Pakistan, uh, China is uh, Pakistan's closest and considered to be its most reliable ally. So that brings us into tension with, uh, with Pakistan. At the same time, there is this historical tension with India. And in fact, I, as I pointed out in my book, and I just had a conversation just today with the last US student that graduated from Wellington, you know, the famous USS Enterprise sortie into the Indian Ocean in 1972, uh, which was undertaken during the Nixon administration has never been forgotten. It has never been forgiven. And basically what this kindles in the Indian mindset is that in the event of a future uh, war or crisis with Pakistan, that the US will interpose itself between the two and deny India the fruits of victory, just as it denied India the fruits of victory in 1971. So I, I, think, I think that's what is at work. Now there's another notion that's at work here, and that is India has embraced this concept of strategic autonomy. And we have a saying in the United States that sometimes when somebody wants to have things both ways, that they're being they're asking to have their cake and to eat it too. And this is what strategic autonomy represents for India. India wishes to have a good relationship with the United States uh, because it is deeply concerned about Chinese penetration into the Indian Ocean region, particularly in the maritime realm. Uh, but at the same time, But at the same time, it wishes to maintain its links with Russia because it has a lot of legacy military hardware systems. And for example, let's, let's just give one example. They're buying the S-400 air defense system from Russia. This poses a huge problem between our two countries because we have a law on the books which was passed by Congress called CATSA, which is the Countering America's Adversaries Through Sanctions Act. We have already sanctioned a NATO ally, Turkey, for buying that system. We have not yet made a decision on whether we will have to sanction India for buying that system. But what this points out is that there are numerous friction points in the strategic relationship. Another one is India's relationship with Iran and its, uh, its work at the port of Chabahar in order to have a, another alternative route into Afghanistan. Uh, for example. So India wants to have its cake and eat it too. It wants to have good strategic relations with the United States, but to maintain its links with states like Russia and Iran. That's a huge problem for this new administration, which has not yet crafted its South Asian foreign policy. Okay, thank you. That is a good take on the, on the entire thing. Um, one of the things that you have been critical of uh, regarding Wellington uh, is the lack of jointness. It's a tri-services uh, staff college, but it's basically army. And you made a very interesting, one of the students made a very interesting uh, link that, yeah, A-R-M-Y. So that's, that's how it goes, uh, rather than, you know, being the army, navy, and the air force. So the lack of jointness is something that is a concern for any modern army. And given the fact that uh, the US wants India to play a lead role in its Indo-Pacific strategy, uh, you do realize that the importance of the Navy and even the Air Force and the, kind, the kinds and types of um, defense partnerships that uh, the US is doing with India, it, it it means that both the Navy and the Air Force have to have to up their games. So in that context, how do you see this lack of jointness impeding Indo-US relations, military relations going forward? Well, there's two issues here. Number one is uh, what are the problems of lack of jointness and what are the ramifications of that? And uh, the second is, does it impede uh, United States working with the Indian services. 
let me answer the second question first. Not really. Uh, and the reason is primarily because we don't do a lot of working with them. Uh, you know, there's a lot made about US exercises, Army, Navy, and Air Force with the Indian Armed Forces. Uh, but these, uh, these exercises are really what we would call in the United States, small potatoes. They're not large exercises. They typically involve a small number of ships, a relatively small number of aircraft, and a small number of soldiers, sometimes not even more than a company or a, a, a battalion at the most. So uh, that lack of jointness does not get in the way because those kinds of operations typically are service to service rather than armed forces to armed forces. But the point about jointness is, and this is one of the most surprising findings in the Wellington experience, because Wellington was set up at the very outset to be a tri-service uh, staff college to imbue the Indian Armed Forces with the notion of working together. Uh, and in fact, if you look at the curriculum uh, at, at uh, Wellington, you know, more than 60% of the curriculum is quote unquote jointness. But, you know, there is the form and there is the substance. And the substance is joint operations or joint exercises as they are conducted at Wellington are not truly joint in our way of understanding jointness. Uh, for example, the, uh, the capstone exercise at Wellington every year is typically an amphibious assault to regain an island that has been seized by an enemy of India that suspiciously looks like it's Chinese. And therefore it requires an amphibious operation with the cooperation of the all three services. But in fact, what happens at Wellington is that the plan for this operation is conducted in three separate locations by three separate groups of officers. And at the conclusion of the planning process, the three plans are sequentially briefed. Now, what is supposed to happen at the conclusion of this is that there is a process of joint deconfliction to iron out any problems in, uh, you know, in working together from service to service. But this never happens in practice. And I've been in conversations with very high ranking uh, Indian military officers that say, you know, you Americans are, you know, you're all talk, always talking about this jointness. We don't really see the need for it. And this is primarily for one reason. Number one, as I pointed out in the book, this is an institution that is army centric. And because the Indian army basically has two potential adversaries, one China and one Pakistan, it does not rely on the Air Force or the Navy to get it to the theater of operations, which is unlike the United States. You know, we can't do anything in the Army without flying on an Air Force plane or riding in a Navy ship. That's our way that we get to the battle. This is not true in India. So that's one of the reasons. Another reason is the civil military relationship that has been established in India over years. And I would point out that there's a scholar named Anit Mukherjee who has written an exceptionally fine book about Indian civil military relations, uh, which I would advocate all of you uh, on the Pakistan side should read. But he talks about what he calls the I will go it alone syndrome, which is the method of thinking for each of the three services. They pay a lot of lip service to jointness there is, after all, a chief of the defense staff that's about a year into his office, and there is an integrated defense staff as well. But in fact, and this is the substance of it, in fact, they do very little. India still has too many single service commands. Right now, it only has two truly joint commands, uh, one for strategic forces and one for the Andamans and Nicobar Islands. And they're looking at a couple of other things but they still have not yet moved beyond those two joint commands. So there's a long way to go for them to be truly joint. In the uh, event of a future war with China, China will not have those problems. China routinely uh, rehearses tri-service operations in a way that uh, 
we look at and we are concerned about our ability to operate against them as well. Okay, thank you very much. Now this reminds me uh, of a very uh, famous book authored by the late Stephen Cohen and Sunil Das Gupta, Arming Without Aiming. So that, you know, if I look at the doctrinal thinking and the doctrinal uh, concepts that are being imparted at Wellington, I think that book title really, you know, fits well uh, in this con in that context. Okay, now coming back to India-Pakistan relations. One of the reasons that led you to, you know, conduct and complete this study was the Pulwama Balakot crisis. Yeah, that is the first reason that you wrote in the preamble of the book. So uh, the idea was that, that it was after a lapse of so many years, uh, decades, four decades, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, India tried to penetrate into mainland Pakistan, albeit through the LOC, but this is what happened. And mm -hmm. the idea that has developed now is that uh, the Indian leadership, both the political and military leadership, is is fine. It believes that uh, it can get away with doing all, all these kinds of things against Pakistan. So it does not even seemingly believe in the concept of deterrence. It wants to punish Pakistan for its for whatever it thinks Pakistan does. Uh, and this is a very dangerous trend. We saw how the Air Force was engaged and then when uh, Pakistan, you know, leveled the scores and even uh, dominated that rung of the escalation ladder, uh, and the Indians were ready to escalate further with missile strikes. And when, and you know, when missiles, you know, start, uh, you know, being hurled mm -hmm. in, in a nuclear environment, things could go, go haywire. But the idea is that India wanted, India believes that it can use force to exercise, to achieve political ends. Now, with this on one side, and on the other, we have Indian leaders looking and threatening, threatening Pakistan about capturing Azad Kashmir and Gilgit Baltistan. So capturing territories under the control and under the jurisdiction of a nuclear armed state is a very dangerous thing. Now we have two things. And then we go to your book where you say the hostility towards Pakistan is ever increasing. It has increased over decades. While they're reluctant to name China as the enemy, they consider Pakistan to be an inveterate enemy and a very hostile one at that. How do you link all these three into a strategic compendium and, and analyze the way forward for India and Pakistan? Are we in for another crisis? Will the crisis, you know, from onset to termination be very different from previous ones? And what could be the hierarchy of escalation? Thank you. Uh, well, let me, let me just demolish one of the straw men that you raised, which is that the, uh, you know, the India threatening to capture Azad Kashmir and Gilgit Baltistan. I mean, you know, let's let's just take that off the table. That's not going to happen. They don't have the capability to do that. They can't even push the the Chinese off of that ridge and go on. Uh, so, you know, the the idea that they would be able to harness enough forces to actually attack over some of the worst terrain in the world and seize, you know, thousands of kilometers square kilometers of Pakistani territory. I, I see that as, as an idle threat, you know, that should, that's not to be taken seriously. What is to be taken seriously, however, and this is the danger that you allude to, is the unintended consequences of escalation in the event of a future crisis. And so what you've seen, uh, you know, developing over the last five or six years, certainly since 2016, is an increased willingness of this government of uh, Mr. Modi to strike against Pakistan in ways that previously had been considered, uh, you know, off the books. You know, you had the, uh, you know, the, you know, the attack that may or may not have happened after <laughs> Uri and Patankot in 2016. Uh, 
But what you did have in uh, after Pawama was a major escalation by, as you point out, striking deep within Pakistani territory, not in the disputed part of uh, JNK, but into metropolitan Pakistan at the place called Balakot, which, by the way, used to be one of my favorite places prior to the 2005 earthquake, you know, the, the gateway to the uh, Kagan Valley. Uh, but anyway, what you saw after Balakot uh, was two militaries that were really caught in an embarrassing situation. Not just India, but Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan was caught off guard because they did not think, they could not conceive that India would strike that deep into Pakistani territory. And there were gaps in the radar coverage and their ability to scramble fighters to meet that threat. Uh, Pakistan retaliated because Pakistan always retaliates, always in kind and always at a time and place of its choosing. And in that retaliation, it got very, very lucky in that it managed to shoot down an Indian aircraft. Now, this was embarrassing for the Indian Air Force because why in the world would you send a MiG-21 up against an F-16? You know, so they have some questions that they need to answer on their side. So both sides were able to claim, quote, victory after the Pawama Balakot incident. So what happens in the event of another similar terrorist attack? And in my view, it's almost certain that that will come, whether it comes in J and K or whether it comes somewhere in metropolitan India, it will come. Maybe not for years, but it will come. So every time for the last two or three times this has happened, India has ratcheted up its response. Now they're caught in an escalation trap. What will they do the next time? And then what will Pakistan do the next time? In, uh, in a series of war games that I've played for years, or been involved with for years, between Indian and Pakistani senior military officers, we get to what I always call the uh, third move dilemma. Everybody knows what the first move is after a terrorist attack. India strikes or does take some punitive action. Everybody knows what move two is. Pakistan retaliates. But we've never gotten to move three. And if there is a move three, where India ups the escalation, Pakistan may not be able to control the escalatory ladder. And there may be a move four, and then a move five, and then a move six. And it's not clear that both sides are going to be able to control that if they allow it to get out of hand. So that's the danger that you rightly uh, talked about. Okay, so before I move to my last question, I want to set a record straight. It is important for people working on um, escalation patterns in South Asia to, you know, change the framework that they look look Pakistan through. It is absolutely not correct to put it bluntly that terrorism would be the, the be all and the end all of, uh, of crisis onset. It could be the other way around. It could be Indian brutalities in Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir, which have, as you also mentioned in your book, which have increased many folds. So, it is something that we need to work on. Pakistan has done a great deal to curb terrorism and to stand for peace. So I think this needs to be updated. If we want to look at escalation, if we want to enrich the literature in a very unbiased manner, I think it's very important that this tag is removed and we need to broaden our horizons on this. The other important thing that I want to highlight is that escalation could begin through another route. It could be India that could be the initi initiator of a, of a crisis. Uh, it could be India's quest to, you know, to, you know, change the status quo, which it has, it has done with impunity since August 5, 2019. Okay, that's that. My quick last question. Let me, let me just quickly interject. 
Because you're absolutely right, and I'm glad you pointed that out. One of the big dilemmas, though, however, and you must recognize this, is no matter what happens in J and K, whether it is whether the next act, you know, is caused by an, part of the indigenous population. I mean, that's what happened at the Kowam, right? Uh, you know, somebody who radicalized himself. But the, the point is that the Indians are not going to give Pakistan a buy. Whatever happens on Indian soil is going to be blamed on Pakistan. And you rightly point out that there's another dimension to this. You know, the dimension that comes, you know, from the, uh, the Pakistani view that uh, India is destabilizing the two Western provinces of Pakistan, Balochistan and, and Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. Uh, and so the escalatory ladder could start with Pakistan making move one and India making move two. And then the onus would be on Pakistan about what would be move three. So whether the escalation starts by one side or the other doesn't matter. You still have the move three dilemma and it's still hard for me to see how escalation beyond the move three can be controlled. Okay. Now quickly, last question, because we are running out of time. Uh, you have written a lot on tactical nuclear weapons. Your essay has been quoted many, many a time by many people. Uh, and I know what you think about tactical nuclear weapons and, and, and their efficacies. Uh, but you have been very clear in saying that the Indians in the Indian army officers are not you know, they're not bothered by Pakistan's nuclear program in the sense that uh, there is little discussion in Wellington about Pakistan's nuclear program and they think that Pakistan is just bluffing. And more so, uh, this becomes more uh, visible when it comes to tactical nuclear weapons. And you've also said that when a student officer tries to uh, come up with an out of the box solution, he's, uh, you know, snubbed by his DS or the SI. Uh, that no, this is not not likely to happen. So, and you've also said that uh, India could, going forward, uh, breach pa one of Pakistan's red lines. So how do you look at this and what could be uh, the impact of this phenomenon on future escalation and what will that, you know, mean for the US in terms of crisis diplomacy? Uh, thank you. Okay, I'll try to be brief. The, uh, the Indian thinking about nuclear weapons is basically that uh, they, have, uh, they have established deterrence uh, over Pakistan. Uh, they take a look at things like Cargill and, and, other, uh, and other situations that have arisen and says, well, this is an example of you know, nuclear deterrence. And even though both sides have nuclear weapons, we still are able to fight conventionally under the nuclear overhang. I think that's incredibly dangerous. I think that's a terribly dangerous thing. And the question is, why do they think this? And as I wrote in the book, and I'll reiterate here because I can never say it enough, in my opinion, this is based on three fallacies on the part of the Indian thinkers. The first fallacy is basically, as you point out, they see Pakistan as a rational actor. And a rational actor knows that Pakistan may get off a few nuclear weapons, but they would then be utterly destroyed by India. They're a smaller country, you know, a smaller territory. Uh, and therefore, they would never risk the utter annihilation of their own country by using nuclear weapons. The second fallacy is, therefore, they are bluffing, as you've already pointed out. And that's terribly provocative when it's said by the chief of army staff who has said it on several occasions. And then the third thing is, well, even if they aren't bluffing and even if they do use a nuclear weapon on us, we are so much better than they are that we will be able to fight through in a nuclear uh, environment. All these things are horribly wrong. And you know, this is a subject that was once studied in great detail at Wellington in the 1950s and the 1960s. Same is true at Quetta. But uh, in, neither, in neither case do the Pakistani or Indian militaries think very deeply about nuclear issues and the ramifications. I find this enormously destabilizing because both sides are right now, as we speak, in the uh, process of operationalizing a nuclear triad. 
And, this, and the operators of the nuclear triad are by definition the military services. So I would think uh, it's incumbent upon both Pakistan and India to start studying the implications and ramifications of these erroneous assumptions. Uh, and they need to do it sooner rather than later. Thank you very much, Colonel Smith, for a very interesting and a very, uh, you know, wide ranging talk on your book and on the prospects of Indian Army's ability to, you know, navigate the, the future challenges that they face and, and the implications of, of those on uh, South Asian strategic stability. I, I, I would like to um, uh, say that uh, it is important, both the studies were important in more ways than one. It is important for uh, outside watchers to understand how militaries and the cream creams of both militaries look at uh, Im all important issues. I could have talked about uh, your not acknowledging the role of Hindutva, but then you in your subsequent talks have already acknowledged that things have changed post 2017. So that is why I just focused on the military aspects of this book. Um, I look forward to engaging with you further. I'll upload the link and then I'll send it to you and uh, take care. Thank you very much. Um, until next time, goodbye. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me.